places like Cash App, Green Dot, NetSpend, etc. These are not banks and they should not be used as banks, period. Let's talk about it. Hey guys, welcome to the hashtag Get Real Woke podcast. I'm your host, Frederick D. Scott. I'm a private equity investor. I'm a business consultant. I'm a philanthropist. I'm an author and I'm a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine. I have over 15 years of experience in the finance industry and I used to own an investment banking and advisory firm. Currently, I hold designations as a financial modeling and valuation analyst, capital markets and securities analyst, commercial banking and credit analyst, and I also hold a diploma in Islamic finance. And today is hashtag Situation Saturday. This is the time during the week where I come on and and discuss relevant events in the business and finance community. I bring them back to our community, break them down so you can understand it, and together we can hashtag make it make sense. Now, before I get into today's topic, I need everybody to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification, and leave me a comment at the bottom of this video to let me know what you think. Now, listen, if you haven't already, hit the join button if you're on an Android phone, And if you're on an iPhone, hit the link in the description or the link pinned to the comments of this podcast episode so you can become a member of the hashtag Real Woke Live Chat community and be eligible to participate in the hashtag Learn to Earn Cash Giveaway, where I am giving away a minimum of $1,000 every single month live right here on the hashtag Get Real Woke Podcast. Okay, let's get into it today, baby. Let's go and get into it. Listen, so today we're going to talk about alternative banking and the issues that surround alternative banking. Now, what is alternative banking? Let's talk about alternative banking. Alternative banking is when you are using a non-bank financial institution as your bank. So, for example, a good example of that would be like Cash App, NetSpend, you know, uh, green dot, et cetera, right? So these are good examples of non-bank financial institutions that provide banking-like products, right? But the problem with them is that there are are a number of of issues and and we're going to get into them. Now, I don't expect that this is going to be a very long video, but I want to break this down. And the reason why I'm getting into this today is because I have family members that are using alternative banking methods. And, you know, just recently, one of them actually uh, had a situation at the airport where the flight was canceled. They had to, you know, the the money was refunded from from the airline. But unfortunately, it was going to take, you know, five to seven days for that money to be credited back to their account post refund. And it put them in a little bit of a financial crunch. And it was interesting because had they have been using a traditional bank like a JP Morgan, a Chase, Bank of America, something like that, um, there would have been a workaround for this situation. But because they were using a non-bank financial institution uh, like the providers that I, I named previously, you know, like Cash App, NetSpend, you know, Green Dot, et cetera, uh, those those solutions were not available for them. And and we're going to talk about this more. Now, why do people in our community, specifically our our community, the African-American community, use non-bank financial institutions as an alternative to opening a bank account? Well, so there are a couple of different reasons. The first one being that, you know, it's possible that at one point in time they did have a bank account, but, you know, something went wrong, 
you know, maybe they, uh, you know, lost a job or maybe they just weren't good with financial management and, you know, the account went into the negative. They started getting hit with, you know, overdraft fees, et cetera. The balance kind of the negative balance kind of ballooned a little bit and they didn't have the money to bring it current or just weren't interested in bringing it current. And so the bank, the financial institution closed the bank account and reported them to check systems, which makes it very difficult. See, once you get into check systems, and I'm talking about check systems in a minute, but once you get into check systems, it makes it very difficult for you to establish a banking relationship uh, in the future. Now, another reason is, and this primarily is something you hear in the older community, uh, and the, the older subsect of our community, is that they just don't trust the banks. You know, they, they've seen the news, they've watched the news, they think that all banks are, are bad people, that, you know, all bankers are bad people, you know, the banking institutions are out to take advantage of them, somehow get over on them, et cetera, et cetera, and, and they would just rather not use the bank. You know, they understand that they need a debit card, so what they'll do is use an alternative uh, banking situation, what we call a non-bank financial institution on Wall Street, to be able to accomplish this endeavor, right? So they'll get a NetSpin card or they get a Cash App card or, you know, whatever, and, and they'll just bank like that. And, you know, for those that are in check systems, and I'm going to cover check systems just shortly, you know, I understand, you know, why you're doing what you're doing, but I, I want to, let, let's talk about check systems. So what is check systems, first of all? Check systems, you know, and early warning systems. So we have check systems, we have early warning systems, we have a number of different uh, kinds of uh, uh, risk management uh, softwares and systems and procedures that protect us from, you know, high risk uh, uh, banking clients. So for example, right, let's say, you know, what check systems does is very simple. Check systems is a tool that nearly all banks use that allows them to report you if you have uh, mismanaged an account. And that mismanagement could come from a number of different things, right? So you could have closed an account in the negative, you know, the, the two biggest issues, and I'll just tell you the two biggest issues, right? The two biggest issues is that you close an account in the negative or you committed fraud in the account or allowed fraud to be conducted on the account. And what do I mean by allowing fraud to be conducted on the account? So what was going around for a long time, and I'm sure it's still probably going around, is that people were telling people, hey, you know, I can deposit this check into your bank account, you know, just send me your banking credentials, blah, blah, blah. When they lift the hold on the money, you know, just send me this portion and you can keep the rest. Well, what they were doing was they were putting bad checks into the account. Uh, some people were going as far as stealing you know, large companies, uh, payroll routing number and, and checking account number and making fake checks, depositing these into other people's accounts, collecting their money. And then what would happen is when the company or the bank, so when the bank would discover that the check was no good or the company reported the fraud to the financial institution, their financial institution would then notify the other financial institution and that money that was released into the account would be pulled back and it would draw the account into a negative, right? The bank would investigate, they would determine that there was fraud and nine times out of 10, they would close your account and then they would put you in check systems for fraud. They would also put you in early warning systems to let everybody know that you've committed fraud against the bank with your bank account. And, and really, to be honest with you, once you get into a system of fraud, it's 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 really difficult to deal with that, to be honest with you, because, you know, once the bank can determine that you've created fraud and can and can demonstrate that clearly and, and have a justified reason for putting you in early warning systems. I mean, you know, even though, you know, check systems has the same rules that, you know, any uh, collection type situation, credit agency, et cetera, has, you know, they follow Fair Credit Reporting Act guidelines, you know, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, you know, they follow all of those things too. They're, they're subject to those laws, rules, and regulations. But EWS is a little bit different. Early warning systems isn't really subject to those same things. And once you get into early warning systems, you know, it, it's pretty much over for you. Like, I mean, you know, there are ways to fix it, um, but that's case by case, scenario by scenario. And, you know, it would take me hours to go through a number of different scenarios that could potentially uh, be a case, a use case for how it is that you might be able to deal with an early warning systems issue. Now, but with check systems, 
outside of fraud, uh, generally it works the same way as, as anything else. You know, if you think that the, that it's reported inaccurately, you have the right to dispute that. Um, and if, you know, the financial institution doesn't re respond in the requisite amount of time, it has to be deleted. Uh, so the first thing you do is go to check systems, go to the check systems website, and I'll put that in, in the link in the description and ask for a copy of your check systems report. I mean, you're eligible for one for free. I believe it's one annually for free. You definitely get at least one for free every year. Go to the check systems website. I'll drop the link in the description and definitely uh, take a look at your check systems report. Oftentimes, you know, because again, so check systems isn't something that's necessarily reported to your credit report, but it is preventing you from being able to open an account. Oftentimes it's better to just reach out to the financial institution themselves at the number that's listed on the check systems report and work out a payment arrangement. Oftentimes they'll take less. Oftentimes they'll be willing to waive. Let's say there was a number of overdrafts that, that, that drew it into the negative, but the overall the, the underlying negative was, let's say, a couple hundred dollars, but with overdrafts, it got to five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars. I mean, oftentimes the financial institution will go ahead and waive the, the, the overdraft charges and just ask you to settle what you went into the negative for. I mean, you know, there's a number of different workarounds, but the first step is to go ahead and get a copy of your check systems report to see what exactly is on there. So you can begin to get ahead of that. And, and a lot of the same practices that you use with dealing with your credit report is a lot of the same practices that you're going to use with check systems. But with check systems, you know, it's just smarter to pay, right? Because now the bank shows that you pay, you know, that it, it's been rectified. They get you out of the system and then you're able to reestablish normalized banking relationships again, which you need, right? So I wanted to explain check systems real quick so you kind of understand what check systems is, kind of how check systems work, what it's for, how the banks use it, et cetera. Now, so, so now what ends up happening is, so for whatever reason, you know, be it check systems, be it, you know, not trusting the bank or whatever other reason you come up with, you know, a lot of people in our community are using alternative banking, uh, uh, alternative banking situations, non-bank financial institutions. And what they're doing is like essentially what a non-bank financial institution provides you is a prepaid debit card. And, you know, like they're now they've gotten as advanced as allowing you to make direct deposits. Like Cash App allows you to do a direct deposit. They provide you a routing number and a checking account number. And you can set up your direct deposit right to Cash App. Netspin does the same thing. Green Dot does the same thing. And I mean, you know, interestingly enough, that's where they make a lot of their money at is, is, you know, getting people to sign up for direct deposit and, and direct deposit the money. And I can get into all the underlying banking things, but that's not what this conversation is about um, or the, the underlying uh, financial arrangements they have with institutions and how that works, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not really what this conversation is about. So I, I will digress. Now, here's the thing, right? There are two issues, two main issues with alternative banking. And let's talk about the first one. So the first one is the financial issue, right? And that's not so much an issue with Cash App because Cash App provided that, you know, you are, I mean, provided at the end of the day for Cash App, there's really no fees, right? So, you know, they charge you 3% fee if you use a credit card to send money. But outside of that, you know, if you're using Cash App as a method of direct deposit and you're using their little Cash App card or whatever, it's free. The challenge is that to be able to take advantage of the full benefits of, of Cash App, you have to link a bank account. So if you don't have a bank account, like you, you might be restricted from getting such things as like one of those uh, Cash App dollar sign IDs or whatever. You're not going to be able to get that because you don't have a linked bank account. So you're not really able to take advantage of the full benefits of Cash App if you don't have a bank account. So Cash App is one of these non-bank financial institutions that is heavily dependent on, on banking relationships and want you to establish and link a, a bank and a, a, a uh, check debit card from a banking institution to your cash app to be able to unlock all of the features and be able to use the full benefit of cash app. So without a bank account, cash app isn't really as beneficial as it could be, right? So that's the real big issue with cash app if you don't have a bank account and you're using it for alternative methods. Now, if you're just happy with, you know, I got a, look, I got a direct deposit coming all the time. 
you know, it comes right to Cash App, no problems. I got the little Cash App card. I spend my money. I can go to the ATM machine, take my money out, and we great, cool, and wonderful. Great. You know, but but you miss a lot of things, and I'm going to come, come to that when I come to the qualitative side of this. Right now, we're just talking about the quantitative, which is the numbers, right? So so that that's one issue, right? So that that's that's one issue. That's the issue with Cash App, right? Now, NetSpend, and, and I think NetSpend is, is grotesque. NetSpend charges you fees for everything, right? So if you got a NetSpend prepaid debit card, I mean, I'll just go through some of the fees. You know, I, I pulled them up. It was pretty easy. You know, so... If if you if you use a, a Visa member financial institution, you have to pay two dollars and fifty cents for the service. If not, you still have to pay two dollars and fifty cents for making the withdrawal. The only difference is you are also subject to the, the the ATM fee, the financial institutions fee, whatever those fees are, you're subject to those fees as well. So no matter what you do there, you're gonna pay two dollars and fifty cents every time you go to the ATM machine. That means two dollars and fifty cents of your money is taken by net spend every single time you go to the ATM machine. Awful. Now, let's say you want to deposit a check into your net spend account. Well, so you pay the greater of five dollars or one percent of the check's value. Period. That's what it costs. That's what it costs. Awful. And so, you know, the only way you can get around that, you know, is if you'll let them hold your funds for ten days. So they'll they'll waive that fee. But the thing about it is you got to wait 10 days to get your money. Do you really want to wait 10 days to get your money? And speaking of that, by the way, just to put this out there, you know, if you're getting direct deposit to Cash App and let's say you got a bank account set up, all right, great. Do you know they charge a 1% fee for an instant transfer? I just wanted to put that out there for Cash App. It's a 1.5% fee uh, for using the instant transfer to your bank account if you should have a bank account connected. So that means every time you get money to Cash App and you decide that you want to move it to your bank account immediately because, again, most people don't wait a few days for their money. They want their money now. You know, they got a what we'll call a J.G. Wentworth mentality. It's my money and I want it now, right? And, you know, these non-bank, these non-bank financial institutions, these alternative banking type companies definitely bank on your uh, uh, instant gratification mentality, whereby, because you want your money now. Okay, if you want it now, fine, we'll give it to you now. But you got to pay. You got to pay 1.5% of every transaction. And that's that I think is egregious. So that that that's that spin. Green dot has a similar, you know, uh, so that that, that was that 1.5% that covers cash app, right? Now, net spend, you know, I just went through the net spend fees with you as well, which is you know, five dollars or one percent of the check's value. Uh, and that's if it's a payroll check. If it's not a payroll check, like it's just a regular check, uh, you pay five dollars or four percent of the check's value, whichever's higher. So if you got a payroll check, you five five dollars or one percent of the check's value, whichever's higher. If it's not a payroll check, it's just another type of a check. You're gonna pay five dollars or four percent of of the check's value. I mean, this doesn't make sense to me, right? So quantitatively, from the numbers, I mean, if you got a direct deposit set up at a at a traditional bank. Oftentimes, if you just got direct deposit set up, the monthly fee that they charge you to have the account is waived simply because you have direct deposit. So essentially, if you have a job and you get paid a payroll check and that has, and that company has the ability to do direct deposit, the majority of financial institutions, you're going to waive the monthly fee. If you're using the financial institutions, ATM machines, like let's say you use it, go to you bank at Bank of America and you go to a Bank of America ATM machine, it doesn't cost you anything to take your money out. So from a quantitative standpoint alone, traditional banking beats non-bank financial institutions. But let's 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 walk into the qualitative issues, right? And this is these are really the bigger issues. Because other people will say, I don't care, I won't trust a bank, and I'll pay a couple of dollars to not have to deal with the bank. Okay, great. You don't get around the bank. And then let's get to the qualitative side of this. Hey, listen. No matter how you cut this, no matter how you look at this, you're not getting around the bank. I mean, you may be able to, like, you know, do your basic transactions with non-bank financial institutions. But if you ever decide you want to buy a house, if you ever decide that you want to get a car loan, anything like that, you want a mortgage, you want a car loan, you're going to talk to a bank. You're going to talk to a bank. Or you're just going to bleed through the nose in, in interest rate. To be able, like if you go to a buy or pay your car dealership, for example, you're going to pay through the nose and interest for the car. But if you want a good rate, if you want a decent rate, if you want a competitive rate and you got decent credit, you're going to have to go to the bank. 
That's just it. Like, so it's really difficult to get around the bank, you know, for major lending. If you start a business and you decide you need a business loan or a business credit card or something like that, oftentimes you're going to be talking to a bank. And so, you know, when you really think about that, right, it's really difficult to get around the bank uh, in the end. So this brings us to the qualitative issue, which is, you know, with these alternative financial institutions, these non-bank financial institutions, like these net spins, these cash apps, these uh, green dots, et cetera. Listen, there's no relationship for them there. There's no branch that you can walk into and sit down and talk to a personal banker, talk to a business banker, talk to a branch manager, get to know these people. There's no relationship. It's trans The relationship between you and a non-banking financial institution is transactional only. Listen, you make your direct deposit, you use your card, you pay us our fees, you happy, we happy, we ain't got really nothing to talk about, right? They don't provide you mortgages, they don't provide you car loans, they don't do anything like that. They provide the baseline level of financial products for you at a fee that is higher than traditional banks, and that's a fact. But if you're at a bank, right, and, and I'll use this recent example that I that I that I talked about earlier, you know, when that situation happened with my family member who, you know, had the situation with the with the canceled flight, if he had been at a bank, right, what could have happened is he could have picked up the phone, called his branch, talked to his branch manager, or just simply called into the customer service line at the bank, had a conversation. And nine times out of 10, they would have given him a discretionary amount of money for to reflect. So let's say it's $300 that, that the ticket cost, the flight's canceled. It's going to take, you know, seven to 10 days, let's say, for that money to get back into your account for the refund. The bank may be willing and oftentimes will do it if you have a great banking relationship with them and, you know, you your account management and your fiscal management of your account is good. Oftentimes they'll give you a discretionary $300 for 30 days, right? And then they'll pull that money back in 30 days, which gives you your money now. It gives you the ability to access that capital now. So you avoid the financial strain that this could potentially cause you. And as well, uh, you know, you know that in 30 days, that money will be refunded to your account. These are small little things that can be worked out with banks that you can't work out with non-bank financial institutions. You can't work out with the green dots and cash apps and, and places of the world. Like it just doesn't work like that, right? They don't really do that. They're not in the business of relationship banking. They're in the business of transactional, uh, financial, uh, baseline financial products. That's it. And so, you know, I, I want to share this with you because, you know, if you go into a bank, let's say you've been banking at Green Dot, you've been using a Green Dot as a, as a, as a banking option, you've been using NetSpend, you've been using Green Dot as a banking option, and you decide that you want to go get a mortgage, well, nine times out of 10, you got to go see the bank. These people don't know you from a can of paint. You have no relationship with them, but you're coming in to borrow a, a, a large amount of money, which for most consumers buying a home will be the largest expense they ever make, right? At one time, you know, so that being the case, it's the largest loan amount they'll likely ever get. Average consumer's largest loan amount will be a mortgage, period. And so now you're asking them to loan you money on the largest purchase, the, the potentially the largest purchase that you're ever going to make in your life. And they don't know you from a can of paint. They have no relationship with you. You don't have a checking account with them. You have no credit cards with them. You don't have a savings account with them. They're going to scrutinize you a lot harder because they don't have anything to go on, right? And if you get into a situation, and the same applies to a car loan. It's the same concept. And if you get into a situation where your credit is, you know, decent, but not, you know, excellent, and, you know, by the time they look at everything, you know, they underwrite the file, you know, they could go be a yes, it could be a no. They're kind of on the fence about it because they don't have a relationship with you. They're a lot more likely to say no than they will to say yes. Remember, I told you money doesn't make the world go round. People do. People make the world go round. Money is a byproduct of quality relationships. That's it. If you had had a bank account with them, if you had been with them for a while, if you had come into the branch on a regular basis, got to know the branch manager, got to know the personal bankers, maybe took them out to lunch occasionally here and there, maybe once or twice, they'd remember you. 
They know you. If you add a credit card with them, you know, you have financial products. You have a deep relationship with them. And so now when it comes to your mortgage or your car loan, if it's on the fence, you know, that branch manager would be happy to pick up the phone and say, I know this client really well. This is a great client. And I would like to continue to strengthen and deepen the relationship with this client. So while I know it's on the line, if we can just give an exception and get this approved, I think that, you know, we will end up making a client that's been with us that is, you know, really fiscally prudent at the bank and has, you know, different financial products with us very happy. And moreover, I think we may be able to retain this client potentially for a lifetime. And nine times out of 10, that phone call can be all the difference between you getting approved and denying for a loan when you're on the fence like that. And that is the power of using traditional banks. And this is why you don't use uh, alternative banking methods to accomplish these types of things, to accomplish, you know, direct deposit or bank like features. Don't do it. It doesn't work for you long term. It, it, it costs you more money long term. You're not building any relationships where you really need relationships, right? Because if you need to borrow money and you need to borrow a large amount of money, nine times out of 10, you're going to start with your bank first, right? And if you have a problem getting approved at your bank, then you'll, lose, you'll, you'll, you'll start looking at alternative financing arrangements. But at the end of the day, it, the conversation is going to start with your bank. And if you've been watching my videos for a while, if you've been watching my podcast episodes, if you, you know, went through my uh, four part series of credit, uh, uh, of credit mastery, then you're likely on your way to really good, really good credit anyway. You're likely on your way to a really good FICO score anyway, because you learned and applied the things that I, I, I showed you hashtag for the free and you're well on your way to great credit. So if you got great credit, and you got a traditional bank account. Hey, listen, like you well on your way to great rates uh, and, and, and great banking products and, and great relationships that can, you know, smooth out things and, and, and make your life a little bit easier when you have those, those difficult times in your financial life. And they come for everyone. Believe that. All right, guys. So I just wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time talking to you guys about that. I didn't think that this would be a very long video or podcast episode, but I really did want to kind of take the time to break this down and talk to you guys about this because, you know, I just want to stress again, hey, listen, if you are using alternative banking for your banking needs, for your direct deposit, for your, you know, outside of if you've committed fraud on anything, if you've committed fraud on an account, there may be a way to work that around. If you want to reach out to me, you know, offline at Frederick D. Scott uh, on Instagram, I'd be happy to listen to your situation and see if there's a way to work that around to, to get you into a situation where you'd be able to get a traditional bank account again. But, you know, that then is contingent upon the fact that you're going to agree to actually do the right thing in your bank account, right? Because I'm not just going to help you. Uh, and then you go out and do the same thing again and mess up another financial institution. At the end of the day, you know, I, I, I'm Wall Street first in my professional career, and I love helping people out. I love making an impact. I love that. But at the end of the day, I'm able to make an impact and the type of impact I'm able to make because of the relationships that I have, you know, with different financial institutions, right? So I want to keep those relationships strong. So, you know, I'm very selective about how I help people, you know, accomplish these types of things. Because I don't ever want someone to, you know, who hasn't learned a lesson, who hasn't grown from the mistake to then go out and do the same thing again based on something I helped them accomplish. OK, so that's it, guys. That's all I really have for you guys today. Hey, listen, if you like the content, if you like the things that I'm sharing, hey, go ahead and hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification. Leave me a comment at this video at the bottom of this video to let me know what you link. Now, listen, if you haven't already, hey, man, I need you to hit that join button if you want an Android phone. And if you want an iPhone, I need you to hit the link in the description. I need you to hit the link in the comments of this podcast episode. Join the hashtag Real World Live Chat community so you can be eligible to participate in the hashtag Learn to Earn Cash Giveaway. Bro, I'm giving away a minimum of $1,000 every month live right here on the hashtag Get Real World Podcast. Hey, man, come get this money, man. I'm trying to bless the community, man. I'm trying to give it away. And if you ever see one of my giveaways, you know I'll be turned up on giveaway time. Hey, listen, I'd be more happy to give away the money than I think people are to actually get it. That's the crazy part. So, hey, this ain't finna stop. 
hey man, we're gonna do this month over month over month over month. But why wait till next month when you can have a better opportunity of getting it this month? Hey, that's all I'm saying. Hey, but check this out, y'all. Hey. I again, I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all so much. Continue to like, continue to subscribe, continue to share the content because it's because of y'all that we're growing. We're at 2,500 subscribers right now, which is awesome. Awesome. And, 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 and that's because of y'all. That is because of y'all. That's because y'all, but, but don't forget now, hey, hey, I need y'all to hit that like button, that subscribe button because you know. That YouTube algorithm. Now we gotta work with that YouTube algorithm and get more eyes on this content. If you like the content, then trust me, other people are gonna like this content too. They're gonna love it and they're gonna wanna learn and grow too. So we gotta get more eyes on the content. We gotta get more people around here checking this out. So make sure you definitely hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell notification, leave me a comment at the bottom of the video, and join that hashtag real woke live chat community. Let's get it. Hey, yo, listen, until the next hashtag. Situation Saturday, I'm out!